Hello, thank you for joining us. I'm Stuart Craner, co-founder of The Thinkers 50, the world's leading platform for the latest and best in management ideas. In November, we will be announcing the all-new Thinkers 50 ranking of the world's leading management thinkers and the recipients of the Thinkers 50 Distinguished Achievement Awards. All the information about our event in November can be found at thinkers50.com. It would be fantastic if you could join us. We're announcing the shortlist for the awards over the forthcoming weeks and kicked things off with our shortlist of eight great leadership thinkers to watch out for and the people shortlisted for our Thinkers 50 Leadership Award 2021. And today we're delighted to be talking with one of our shortlisted leadership thinkers, Oleg Konovalov. Oleg is the author of The Vision Code, which promises to provide you with the blueprint to create and execute a compelling vision for your business. Oleg is also the author of Leaderology, Corporate Superpower, How to Cultivate a Winning Culture for Your Business and, or and Organization, and Organizational Anatomy. So please let us know where you're joining us from today and send in any questions for Oleg whenever they occur to you. I'm, I will make sure they're passed on. Our format today is that we have 45 minutes. Oleg is going to share some ideas and then we will have a conversation fueled by your questions. So. Oleg, the virtual stage is yours. Welcome. Stuart, thank you very much. Thank you for the great honor and uh, I'm delighted to be invited. Very interesting. Uh, one of the most so often used phrases we can hear at the board meetings, at startups, pitches, and on the, in the daily business conversations, you must have a vision. You know, and we came to a point where vision is often considered as something meaningless and trivial. Uh, this is all wrong because vision is the greatest asset and single most powerful leadership tool uh, that we could have. There are millions of businesses which are meaningless, actually, and they shouldn't be established from a day one because leaders are not thinking about their business is meaningful. They're thinking about money reports, but money can't buy meaning. And the difference between meaningless and meaningful and valuable for us is, is vision. I'm not what happened to me. I'm what I choose to be. We need to have this asset to make our lives uh, and businesses meaningful, vision. We need to have a vision to master the future. And uh, vision, you see, allows us to define and live to our highest purpose. It's a ladder to success. It's a mean of breaking out of non-satisfactory present. Actually, a very interesting point. It's about when we talk about corporations or even small businesses, it's about succession. Vision is a great legacy. We wouldn't be remembered by the next generation for money or house that we would leave for them behind. We will be remembered for the lessons. And in business terms, vision allows us connecting different generations of employees around the common goal. And the greatness of your success depends on the greatness of your vision. I have learned one thing. Life is not a place we live, but a path we take. Vision defines a path to the future down the, which a true leader must lead others. So vision is not a statement which we often assume, ah, that's just a statement nailed to a wall. No, this is a multidimensional space in the future that we create. And if we have no vision for for the business, or then we have no real purpose. And that could be found in many businesses across the world, regardless of their size, industry, or country. People just nod their heads and uh, pay lip service to a vision without really buying it. But what vision is? Vision is aspiration for the future that we strive to make reality today. It's a future reality to, created today for the benefit of others. Here we have a, a very serious problem. In my research, I came to a shocking fact that we're living in a time of leadership blindness. Less than 0.1% of modern leaders have vision. 
it's even actually less than 0 0.1, but it's just rounded to 0 0.1 to make it a bit nicer. At best, the vast majority of leaders they talk about personal ambitions, uh, some kind of a great result next year or something like that. So majority of leaders are not leading people into the future. The best scenario, they're leading people into the present. And many of leaders leading people just into the past, which is not good at all. And yet, you see, vision can be taught. But none, none of us were taught about vision. So far, it was quite a fizzy description. Uh, but vision is a process of creation. So we are all creators of our future. And when we create it, we, f we would realize that vision is greater than an organization, is greater than a person himself. So it's not a statement. It's a force uh, that created within you and is powerful enough to change the world. How vision comes? Vision is vision comes when your conscious awareness of a problem you want to solve for a benefit of others reaches its peak. It doesn't come overnight. It takes time and effort. So it's not about, oh, we'll draft a vision statement during a board meeting. No. It's about where you would commit yourself. And does it worth your full commitment? You will commit yourself fully, and everything you you will do from that moment will become meaningful. This is a moment where you become wiser, not just smarter. Being smart these days is not enough. We're all taught to be smart. Being smart is good, but it's more or less two-dimensional. To live a meaningful life, we need to be wise, because... Wisdom is multidimensional. It's transferable to others. I could share wisdom, but I can't share my smartness. Uh, and it allows to finding greater solutions beyond problems. And just as a result, the world would be better. Vision grows from the deepest aspirations, which become a very focused solution to a great problem. It's not just for a selected few, so gifted few. It's not a gift. The gift is only an ability to be focused and think and work beyond the present. This is also can be taught. You know, it gives a tremendous practical value. For instance, you know, this famous uh, company WD-40 with this famous spray. Actually, with a Mona product, their capitalization now is almost $3 billion. And every household uh, is having it. Every Formula One team. And uh, what I would say, wisdom always pays the highest rate. What is the cost of blind leadership? I had a conversation with a CEO of one of the largest IT companies not long ago. And he said, look, we quickly learned that corporate politics would lead us nowhere in, unless into troubles. We need vision to succeed. And that was so powerful for me because even such a giants, they need to revise their vision all the time. What is the most challenging? You know, we, uh, we have a, an issue which I call the mind lock. You know, when you travel between continents, we are facing uh, jet lock, which could be recovered within a few days. But mind lock, because we're thinking too much about the past, very little about the present, and almost nothing about the future. People are afraid of the future. Instead of being afraid, we could create it and live in, in satisfactory future, which is great. And so the aim of leaders to close this mind lock towards the future, not towards the past. Even think, if we have a question, that means we don't have a, an answer for that question from the past. It's most likely that we need to create, the, uh, to create the answer to this question in the future based on what we need. So visionary leadership is about future thinking. 
that defines their mindset. What I have found that vision, as we mentioned, is not a gift, but is a six-step process. I call it, you know, forgive my fishing industry experience, but I call it caviar, still delicious. C stands for clarity of creation because vision comes when your conscious awareness of a problem you want to solve reaches its peak. So it doesn't come overnight. Vision grows from your deepest aspiration. Yet it must be supported by the great ability to manage it because it's huge. An ability, it's not about how good am I today. It's about I must grow myself to be strong enough to manage tomorrow with greater goals. And this is about having a courage to think differently, learn all the time, enhance all your inner excellence, be confident and credible. And it's about creating a knowledge bank where everyone could contribute to it. And actually, you grow with your vision. If you stop growing, your vision will stop growing and it will collapse. It will be uh, overtaken by reality, fast-changing reality. In cover, V stands for viability. You know, vision is exceptionally pragmatic. It's not an illusion. So as long as it's pragmatic, it's functionable. And there are no such thing, things as a weak vision, because it's more or less is an illusion. It must be really functional, and there are six criteria of strong vision. Stimulus, which is about reflecting the core of leadership, acting for people and for their needs and acting with people. But vision must reflect a value created for people. Without stimulus, without that value, vision collapses because no one would support it. People don't see the value for themselves and they would ignore it. So to get a response to that stimulus, you must share the value with people. Vision is about scale. And it's not just about, oh, it's big. It's about growing in depth and in breadth. And it's about adding value at every stage of its development or achievement. It's not about promises that, oh, within 30 years' time, everything will be great. No, it's about value added at every stage. That allows us to expand. We could look at a very simple practical point. Your markets grow with more value being added to people, and then markets would open, open their doors. So uh, in simple terms, your vision shouldn't have a period at the end. Scanning is very important because you scan for changes, what is painful, what needs improvement, and so where that value should be elaborated. Vision leaders could see something that others don't see. They're very good at listening. They're very good at learning. Spotlight is a very interesting point because Vision assumes responsibility, immediate and extended, because you're impacting people's life. You know, it's like being on Broadway for 24-7, 365 days a year. And a greater vision assumes greater responsibility. So people must see that you put your skin into this game. Very interesting factor of a strong vision is simplicity. Vision is an elegant thinking about complicated things. Because if it's uh, simple, it can be understood. People would grasp it. But if it's complicated, people would not take it. You know. It's too complex. No. We can't articulate it. We can't execute it. No. They would say no. And that would reflect simplicity, reflects structured thinking. Complexity shows that it's a lot of mess behind all this. So people are just naturally avoiding it. And the sixth element of a strong vision is excitement and passion, because 
vision is a strong emotion itself. And uh, without passion, the vision doesn't have that emotional power. Real passion can't be seen in others who become multipliers of your vision. And passion actually is a very serious business itself. So back to this caviar model, influence, I. It's about how to expand your vision, how to communicate it. And I came to an interesting point. What is the difference between communicating vision and sharing vision? We communicate facts, but we share emotions and stories. So we need, for a vision to be influential, we need both communication and sharing. People love hear stories, but what they love more, they want to be a proud part of that story. And the true magic in communicating vision lies in the ability to make others the co-owners of vision. And the ownership of vision can be defined by realizing who owns the result of vision. So if people don't see themselves in that vision of benefiting from them, they wouldn't be with it. There is vision without influence doesn't have that magnitude. Acting. Acting is very interesting because vision stands and lives on acting. Without execution, vision is a dream only. We are all kitchen visionaries if we are not acting. And it demands strong leadership, which is based on ability to maintain a strong corporate culture, excellent communication, focus and will, not only leaders, but his team as well. It's about enabling decision-making and high quality and clear metrics of execution. Vision and leadership will be judged based on the leader's promises and people expectations. Therefore, it's not about pleasing people. It's not about consensus, but it's about delivering promises when you're taking people into that prosperous future. Revitalizing. You know, vision is not static. It's life. It must be revitalized. And so the higher we claim, the further we see, we see more opportunities, we're adding more life, we're adding better meanings, it's like a movie or a novel. At every stage, it's a sign to be continued. If, it's, if you achieve something and you will rest in this comfort zone, your vision will die. That happens to many companies. Those were very successful at a certain point. Nokia, BlackBerry, Kodak. They relaxed in the comfort zone. Intel these days having a lot of troubles uh, because they assume they were very successful before the challenge in a big, big way. So it's about revitalizing your vision and grow further. What is important to consider? Vision doesn't have gender, race, or nationality. We need and value all talents and qualities for a vision to grow and be executed. So I need all hands on board. And I have experience of working with people across the globe and almost 50% of, of my clients and participants on the course are women. People of different age, educational background, corporate roles, they're all there because they want to change something beyond themselves. So vision is the greatest asset that any organization can have. And vision defines our evolution. Vision defines evolution of our businesses. Now it's a practical tool, available to all leaders across the globe. Being a visionary is similar to putting your own signature on that future, being here now. So put your signature on the future now.
Thank you. Full, full, full of ideas as always. Some, some great lines in there as well. And thank you everyone for joining us. We've got people from Nigeria, Poland, India, the United States, Belgium, and even uh, Veronique Jones from the capital of the world, which we know to be Manchester. Uh, so thank yeah. you everyone for joining us. Uh, please send in your, your questions if you have them for Oleg on anything to do with, with vision and leadership, and uh, he will be sure to answer. And here's, here's a question from Ola. Um, Valika in, in Poland. How can we avoid the danger of falling for a vision of a charismatic but poor leader? I mean, I suppose that's the the archetypal archetypal criticism of vision. It can be used by uh, malevolent leaders uh, to achieve their uh, mistaken uh, objectives. Or I believe it's a bit of that question is a bit. On a cross line, because what happens? You can't be a leader if you don't act for people. If you're a poor leader, you're not acting for people, so your your vision wouldn't be a vision. It would be more of of your personal ambitions, because you don't see people in your vision. You don't create value for them, and so your team wouldn't be engaged. Your team would be just. In, under command that would be a, a bit of a difference so leadership what we could say can I improve to become a better a stronger visionary leader by the main term do you see people or is it driven by your ego ego kills vision so poor leadership is driven by ego that kills vision so it's just a statement oh I have a vision how you could prove it can you run it through this I have that vision viability test? And it will fail in the first instance on stimulus because we're a little for people. Yeah, an interesting point from Anshaman Tiwari, who I think I think has met, it met you previously. Um, for organizational success, vision needs to be shared as, as well. So how do we ensure we have a shared vision? Because there's kind of two things you, you said, Oleg, that um, vision is a ma isn't a matter about a consensus. No. At, at the same time, how, how do you share? Uh, we could see a value for everyone, you know, or that value can be viewed from different angles. You know, somebody saying, yeah, that would make my life better. Here I could see a huge cause why I should do this because it's a lot for society. So everyone could see that vision from different points. Therefore, a leader must talk to everyone and listen, not just declaring or sending corporate messages, you know, tapping keyboard. No, it's about being fully involved with people, being with them and listen to their response. It's about that eternal loop of feedback we're exchanging meanings and we're co-creating a joint meaning that we all would fight for. We will commit ourselves. I suppose leaders are sucked into believing if, if, they, have, if they have a vision, they don't need to listen. And that is totally wrong because all visionaries I know, they're very good at listening. Uh, it's mainly assumed that Great leaders are great learners. Yes, but the first, they're great listeners. If people are not listening to you, and I came across many of such leaders, if they're not prepared to listen, they're left alone. They don't know a reality. They're not grounded to a reality. You can't learn without listening. You can't be grounded to a reality without listening to people. You actually, for instance, we mentioned ego. We all have ego. This is normal human trait. But it's, you can't control it without feedback from others because then you, your ego would grow, grow like a huge bubble. So it's about listening. It's very much about listening. You're listening to environment. You're listening to people. And so we're learning from them, and you could find solutions that could allow you to come with fantastic solutions. 
there's a couple of questions which kind of echo each other about how, how we teach uh, uh, the visionary leadership. So Mina M. Poyo, who's in uh, Brussels, mm -hmm. uh, how, how would you teach visionary wisdom to business leaders? So that's one kind of about, about teaching. And Sapriya Roy Sohi, who's in uh, Bangalore, says, mm -hmm. how, how do we develop aspiring leaders to develop a vision? First, it's about mindset. As I mentioned, we all have mind lock issue to different extent. So it's about to read people out from the past thinking into and turn them into their future thinking. Because leader is someone who is leading people into the future. And therefore, it's about future thinking. That's about first aim is to shift that focus. It's about really being focused on the future and where I do lead people. That is very much about this. Aspirations comes with it because what interesting I have found is I'm inspired by having a great vision, but with my vision growing, my it impacts and inspires me even more. So it's like an internal chain. It's not about motivation. I would pay nothing for motivation because it's a short-term push. You know, every Christmas, regardless of what people think, oh, I will go to a gym after Christmas, I got fodder. Gym is empty. You know, because motivation uh, is a very short lifespan. But when you inspire, people become inspired and they're inspiring others so it has a huge ripple effect and when you have a really true vision you become a source of this inspiration you are not motivated you're passionate you're inspired you are prepared to, to go not just extra mile you you're jumping over the moon so has, has the pandemic challenged these ideas then, Oleg? I mean, you talk about past, past and the future and looking to the future, but at the moment in the last 18 months, it's been very difficult for anybody to really focus on the future when the present is so all enveloping. So how has the pandemic informed and challenged these ideas, do you think? My answer would be a bit tough. It was a very interesting, I came to a very interesting observation. There were two types of people. One was thinking, hey, we need to find a solution to get out of this problem. And a huge part, I would say a majority of leaders uh, found COVID as a great excuse to do nothing. You know, you're talking with people, no, 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 we can't do much. You could imagine it's a COVID now. So those who are courageous enough to look beyond today, vision is for them. But it's not for the people who are using every problem as an excuse not to do, not to act, not to care. That was a very interesting observation. One thing I'm interested in is, is the life expectancy of a vision. You said that a, vi a vision has to evolve and, and change with time. But how long do visions last? Is it, is it a year, two years, five years, ten years? I mean, you can see some that have last stood the test of time and others haven't. If you are good enough revitalizing it every two, three years, not changing it. The core is there. Uh, you're revitalizing it to make it stronger. Your vision would last decades. It would last a decade. Every vision would be disrupted at one point or another. But if it's not disrupted, it, it would last decades. And even, uh, I would bring a simple example, Nelson Mandela's vision is still alive, even with him being passed away a long time ago, for instance. So it could change, it could experience some changes. We talk, for instance, about Apple. 
Steve Jobs' vision because it's transformed. In effect, but it's, the core is still there. And uh, so it's actually very long living. It, the companies, we know that one company is losing standards and pools 500 list every week. Why? Because they are short of funds? No, they have a lot of resources because they're losing their vision. So if you're losing your vision, if you're not renewing it, it becomes redundant. So it's that app appetite for constant renewal. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because we add new meanings, we add new energy to it, and it's we inspire further. Actually, it's about a very interesting point I have observed. Younger generation look at vision of previous generations slightly differently. Therefore, it must be also renewed in terms of how it's digestible for them, how it's valuable for them. The core is there. A language of it has changed. Interesting point from Alexandra in Poland. How does a company's purpose translate into a vision? Meaning purpose is one of those words that's that's used a lot yeah. in, in this space. I think there's kind of, uh, it, it's, it's good to have some clarity about what the well, difference yeah. is between a purpose and, and a vision. I would use my personal example. Okay, my purpose is to explore a new fields. I'm an explorer by nature, right? So uh, my vision, is to create a practical tool which could help a million leaders to become visionaries. It's still about, my, uh, it would align my purpose and my vision are aligned. So if your company purpose, for instance, to produce something that would solve a certain problem and your vision with how the people would act within it, what would be the practical outcome of your purpose and that would allow people to live and, and act within that space. So pur purpose and vision have to be aligned. Absolutely. Completely aligned. Absolutely. And and is it common, do you think, that they're, they're not aligned, in, that companies just have a kind of a spurious uh, vision and it, there's no relation to the, a, a purpose they've expressed elsewhere? He's, uh, Stuart, uh, the shocking truth, there are too many companies which are absolutely frustrating about this. They're relying on statements. They believe that sta their statements would inspire people. We're not. And they think, oh, our purpose to be the best, which is about competition with, I don't know, with whom. And what's your goal? Oh, we want to be like a billion dollar company. Okay, who cares? Who will be inspired by that vision? Because it's not a vision, it's just ambitious. So, and uh, even with the companies we could fairly well define their purpose, they don't know how to define that space uh, in the future where they invite people to be and act and live. Therefore, there is no commitment from people because they don't see anything for themselves. Can you succeed without a vision in the long term? I don't think so. No. Uh, you know, it's like being married to someone you don't love. Yeah, you might live as a social exchange, you know. <laughs> I'll bring salary, you do cooking, you know, just like we still smile at each other. But it wouldn't be a commitment. T t tell us about you. You mentioned uh, you, re you referred to caviar and uh, your experience in the fishing industry. So t tell us about that and how, how it in informs your, your, your current work. I used to work with one of the greatest North Sea captains, Jack Lilly. The guy is about five feet tall, you know, 5.2 feet tall, you know after two strokes, but he was so exceptional fisherman. And uh, it was amazing. He got that gut feeling where the fish is. And uh, 
you can imagine working on a small trawler in the North Atlantic, which is fairly dangerous stuff. But he was always saying, hey, guys, my job is to bring you back home with money and in one piece. I don't want to stand in front of your widows. And uh, working with him was a great lesson for me, probably greater or one of the greatest lessons I have learned. And uh, it's about taking full responsibility of that day when we arrive back to port. And it was a very amazing experience. Mm. And, the, and, and the relationship between responsibility and vision is quite interesting, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Because in, in some ways, vision can be interpreted as a kind of a dereliction of, of a responsibility in that you put responsibility into the future. Oh, yeah, something would happen, which I don't know, and um, I wash my hands, so I'm not about this. No, your skin is in the game. You're putting yourself into it fully, and therefore you, the way you think, the way you act, the way you feel accountable for is defines everything. It's... Uh, Actually, many rely on control instead of responsibility. But control is an illusion unless the people who are in charge of everything feel really committed to it. And they will be responsible. They will be considered or taken accountable for this. And that is a very interesting distinguished uh, difference because those poor leaders they're exercising control where good leaders they talk about responsibility own responsibility and they're sharing it and modeling it on others he talks about vision being a great legacy which i think is an, in, an interesting thing because like vision is not normally seen in those in in, the, in those terms we are getting great lessons from vision itself and from that journey to a vision to achieving a vision those lessons can be shared we with a vision we found we created certain solutions which are transferable to the next generation we're living artifacts for the next generation which must be better visionaries rather than we are it's not about insisting the next generation to repeat our mistakes. It's about helping them to create solutions which are beyond them. And that would define human evolution to some extent. So you talked about leadership blindness. <laughs> it's a nice way. Just tell us a little bit more by what you, what you mean about leadership blindness. I think we, we I think we've all got an idea what it is, but what, 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 what do you what do you think it is? Yeah, that's Stuart, it's a very interesting point because, uh, I, well, uh, I was brought up in the former Soviet Union with all this communist propaganda promising us something like we would live in a bright future. I don't want to see that bright future. You know, I want to see a real result because it's not about promises. It's about real change, real improvement. And unfortunately, uh, too many leaders, they're not showing that difference. They're just trying to promise something that's actually either non-achievable or nonsensical. They're very simple. They're just blind in terms of how to lead people into the future. And I don't need a leader to lead me into the present. You know, I don't need a captain to stay in the port i need a, you know i need someone who would help me to cross that sea rough sea and this is where blindness comes in because those many too many leaders are simply blind you start talking with leaders okay what's your plans for the nearest three to five years oh yeah the plans are here. can you think about those three to five years ahead what's your thoughts about no. How can you lead people if you don't know where you are leading them? 
But are, are there cultural differences? I mean, you said that vision is a great, is a universal thing. Um, but it's, it seems to me that some cultures are probably more predisposed to looking to the future than uh, ones they say the American culture is, is very action oriented and very, very focused on the present in many ways, where stereotypically you would say the Japanese culture. I mean, there's famously examples of Japanese companies that have a 10 year plan or 20 year plan or longer. Uh, so are there, are there different cultural responses to the idea of vision in your, in your work, do you think? Great question. And actually what I have found that in many cases, people still need to have a vision and they're craving for it. Yes, there are some cultures which are encouraging vision, for instance, as you mentioned, American culture. Uh, and they're, they're really good at saying, yeah, I will grab it. But it's still about leaders who are creating the teams of visionaries. That is the most challenging part. You can't be a visionary on your own. And in some situation, you must overcome those cultural obstacles when you're creating a team of visionaries. India is good at it. Arabic countries are very good at it. Some countries are more resistant because they're saying, no, we're happy with what we have. Yes, there are differences. But again, it all comes to, to people who are prepared to act beyond today. It's only the, how culture supports it or resists it. Yes, there are some differences. So, so what's happening beyond today for you then, Oleg? So where, where does this work lead to now? Have you got, you, I, presu I presume you've got another book in, in the pipeline. Stuart, every time I'm finishing the book, I'm promising myself, no, I'd say it's the last book. And of course, I'm already knee deep into a new project. Because what I have found, you see, there is a space between the present and the future. And... A leader is fully accountable for leading people in this space. And it's about mindset as the strongest leadership tool. Because you can't be visionary, you can't think strategy, you can't think people with appropriate true leadership mindset. And the challenging part, of course, to turn it into a practical algorithm. How to develop it. This is what up, I'm up to these days. And, and can that be done, do you think? I wouldn't say that would, it would be the final solution, but if it would help people in the nearest future to become stronger and find the next solution, I will be really honored and blessed. And go back, remind us again, you, you talked about briefly about what your, your personal vision is. Just, just, just go back to... I want to create a million visionary leaders across the globe because they would impact another millions of people and that could because it's about helping people to become solution finders not problem solvers yeah it's, it's just an, it, it is a very different way of looking at the world isn't it absolutely absolutely because we're all problem solvers you know we're kings of the problem solving but it's about solution finders how to create them how to help them to grow and they would make it that world different. A, 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 a great vision. Uh, I can recommend the book. Uh, oh, the, the Vision Code. I even I was just showing you that uh, I have my copies post <laughs> post me at all times, Oleg. Uh, check out Oleg. How can people find out more about your your work, Oleg? Oh, they could go on my website, olegkanavalov.com. They can find me on LinkedIn. I'm always happy to respond uh, to, to messages. And uh, they could look at my book, The Vision Code, and if it clicks, uh, cool. I'm happy to chat. Thank you. Okay, Oleg Konovalov. Uh, recommend his book, the, the, the Vision Code, and check out Oleg's website if you, if you want to know more. Um, we look forward to his work, his forthcoming work uh, as well. Uh, thank you all for joining us from around the world today. Uh, next week, we'll be joined by David de Kramer, who's one of the people who's been shortlisted for the Thinkers 50 Digital Thinking Award for 2021. So, Oleg, thank you very much. And thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you.